South Asia has a rich cultural landscape, unique geography, and diverse population. And the economic aspirations of its over 1.5 billion citizens unite the region. However, this region with the world's fastest expanding economy is also tremendously vulnerable to climate change. Greater access to clean energy will help meet the region's rapid growth without compromising its natural, social and economic resources. The United States Agency for International Development, better known as USAID, is committed to working alongside its South Asian partners to help ensure a just transition from fossil-based to clean energy to drive economic growth and development. Our shared dedication to clean energy and climate action have resulted in USAID's new five-year program the South Asia Regional Energy Partnership or SAREP. This initiative will improve access to affordable, reliable and sustainable energy in six countries. Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, the Maldives, Nepal and Sri Lanka. Over the next five years, SAREP will accelerate renewable energy deployment conserve power through promoting energy efficiency, mobilize billions of dollars in investments and train thousands of employees in the clean energy sector. SARIP will reach these goals by building regional energy markets and enhancing cross-border electricity trade for a regionally integrated grid, deploying and scaling advanced energy solutions such as renewable energy, electric vehicles and distributed energy resources enabling high performing modern power utilities to strengthen their transmission system operation and distribution services and leveraging investments through transparent best value procurement practices and innovative financing instruments additionally SARIP through the South Asia Regional Energy Hub or SARE will facilitate dynamic collaboration coordination and communication among its South Asian stakeholders, champion gender mainstreaming in the energy sector and enable pollution mitigation. Further, through its $12 million partnership fund, SARIP will issue multiple grants to advance green energy solutions and SARIP will also forge deeper energy cooperation and new partnerships in South Asia to achieve net zero targets. Now is the time to galvanize South Asia's clean energy transition. Let's work together through SAREP in empowering the region to meet urgent clean energy goals. A very good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone who has joined us today from different parts of the world. Welcome to the Asia Clean Energy Forum 2022 side event on innovative financing instruments for enabling Asia's clean energy transition. This side event is being organized by USAID's South Asia Regional Energy Hub of the South Asia Regional Energy Partnership or SAREP initiative in partnership with the Asian Development Bank. I am Namrata Mukherjee, Deputy Chief of Party of the USAID SAREP program, and I will be briefly taking you through the flow of today's proceedings. The global energy system will have to undergo a major structural transformation in a very short period to meet the climate goals committed under the Paris Agreement. The annual investment needs for renewable energy and energy efficiency in Asia and the Pacific region for the period 2016 to 2050 are estimated to be in the range of $825 billion to $1.22 trillion. The quantum of financing required at the speed and scale to achieve the clean energy transition for the Asia-Pacific region cannot be provided by governments alone and will require 
massive private sector flows, and innovative green and sustainable financing solutions for clean energy projects. With this background, the key objectives of today's side event are as follows. Number one, presenting the clean energy financing gaps that exist in the region and the challenges for mobilization of finance. Number two, developing awareness among regional stakeholders regarding types of innovative financing instruments that can be tapped to mobilize finance. And number three, providing a platform for exchange of practitioners experience of benefiting from such innovative financing instruments. The proceedings of today's side event are divided in two parts. In the first part of the program, we will have welcome remarks, special address, and a presentation on innovative clean energy financing instruments by three eminent speakers. Mr. John Smithstream, Director of the Indo-Pacific Office, USAID India. Dr. Priyantha Vijayatunga, Chief of the Energy Sector Group in the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department at ADB. And Mr. Anurag Mishra, Senior Clean Energy Specialist at USAID India. In the second part of the program, we will transition to a moderated panel discussion among practitioners of innovative clean energy financing instruments. With this, I will now hand over the proceedings of the side event to John Smith Sreen. John, over to you. Thank you very much, Namrata. On behalf of the United States Agency for International Development, I'd like to welcome all the expert speakers, my colleague, Dr. Wijia Tunga from the Asian Development Bank, and the many participants joining from all around the world. USAID is pleased to jointly organize today's site event with the Asian Development Bank entitled Innovative Financing Instruments for Enabling Asia's Clean Energy Transition. This side event will discuss some of the high potential ideas which can help serve clean and renewable energy market needs in Asia and drive investment from new sources of capital. So first, let me thank you for providing me an opportunity to discuss such issues of importance for the United States, the Indo-Pacific region, and the entire world. We'll be talking about improving access to quality, reliable, and affordable energy, ensuring that as we move forward with economic growth, we reduce particulate matter and greenhouse gases so that our children and the planet can breathe. We'll be supporting the transition to clean and renewable energy across the Indo-Pacific and determining the mechanisms, instruments, and models that will allow financing of this transition. Asia's clean energy transition is vital for global efforts to reduce carbon emissions and achieve net zero. Asia accounts for almost half of global energy demand and is the world's highest emitting region now, having overtaken North America and Europe. As Asia continues to experience high economic growth, we must all work together to better ensure this growth is sustainable, low carbon, and green. Despite the economic challenges posed on all of us by COVID-19, many countries in the Asia Pacific region have continued to witness record-breaking growth in renewable energy. And often this is driven by strong demand from major consumers, both commercial and industrial sectors, who have been increasingly setting targets and collaborating to expand opportunities. Renewable energy, whether solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, bio, or ocean power, is expected to become the primary source of electricity in the long term. By 2030, approximately 48% of the region's demand may well be met by renewable energy. However, many challenges remain for countries on a path of net zero carbon. Chief among these is the challenge of mobilizing enough investment and finance required to support this transition. The, issues the issue has layers of complexity, of course, and also what may be true in one country may not be true in another. However, some generalities can be found. 
Impediments to clean and renewable energy investment include the limited capacity to bring bankable projects to financial closure, weak rule of law that shakes investor confidence, an uncertain or cumbersome regulatory environment, and the absence of a successful record of accomplishment of projects from which we can all learn and which gives financial institutions greater comfort. This means that there's a dearth of available long-term financing for renewable energy. There are higher perceived risks, lower rates of return, and a need to build capacity among various market actors. The International Energy Agency has said that developing and emerging economies account for roughly two-thirds of the world's population, but only one-fifth of the overall investments in clean energy. More needs to be done. The current investment levels in renewable energy and energy efficiency projects in the region are insufficient to achieve carbon neutrality goals. For example, India will need to increase the annual investment in renewable energy from approximately six to 10 billion to 25 to 30 billion. Therefore, to achieve the planned energy transition and carbon neutrality goals, we need to mobilize investment and finance in innovative ways. Mobilizing capital on a much larger scale will require a dramatic increase in the role of the private sector. An enhanced role for international and development finance institutions like USAID and the ADB will be critical to catalyzing this investment. Currently, energy investments across Asia rely heavily on public sources of finance. Public sources of finance, including state-owned enterprises, will continue to play vital roles, especially in grid infrastructure or in situations where the risks are hard to mitigate, such as energy access projects for vulnerable communities or for emerging technologies such as green hydrogen. However, boosting finance to the required scale dem demands a wide range of instruments and approaches, including long-term local currency debt for renewable energy, corporate and consumer finance for efficiency, and risk capital to support new technologies, new companies, and project development. For many years, USAID has successfully enabled innovative financing instruments through our technical assistance and our partnerships. These include green bonds for large-scale renewable energy projects, microfinance to enable energy access solutions, and credit guarantees for small and medium enterprises. We've also worked within the U.S. interagency with organizations like the Development Finance Corporation, or with multilaterals like the Asian Development Bank or the World Bank to leverage additional resources. The U.S. Clean Edge Asia Initiative helps harness the expertise and resources of the United States government, of the private sector, international financial institutions, and like-minded governments to support and accelerate Asia's clean energy transition. As Namrata said, today's event is organized by USAID's South Asia Regional Energy Hub under USAID's South Asia Regional Energy Partnership, or SARUP. Among other things, SARUP supports the adoption of various innovative financing instruments across South Asia. And you will hear more about SARUP and its efforts during today's discussion from my USAID colleague, Anurag Mishra. In conclusion, I'd again like to express our appreciation for your participation in this Asia Clean Energy Forum side event and invite one of the driving forces behind this year's ASIF, Dr. Priyanta Wujiatunga, an expert in energy policy and regulation, energy planning, and clean energy development from the Asia Development Bank for his special remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Proyanta, over to you. Thank you.
thank you very much, John, for that very generous introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. It's great to be here, and thank you very much for this opportunity to provide uh, my initial or uh, special uh, uh, remarks in this important event. And it's great to be here simply because I have been involved uh, even my during my pre-ADB times with the Sari Energy at the time. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a program which did great service to South Asia region. So with those few remarks, let me start off by saying that my address will entirely uh, focus on uh, energy transition mechanism, uh, which is uh, an innovative financing instrument which uh, ADB is uh, pursuing at the moment with uh, you know, the intention of uh, enabling Asia's clean energy transition. So it's quite fitting that I speak on uh, energy transition mechanism uh, in this particular uh, event. As uh, most of you all know, uh, we call it ETM, energy transition mechanism, uh, launched at uh, uh, COP26 in Glasgow uh, in November 2021 uh, has been a long time in the making, to be honest. This concept uh, is not really a new idea. It is an evolution of cash for clunkers, which has been uh, around for at least 30 odd years. It is, an important, it is important to know a bit of history because ETM is about global transition. And although there is a lot of emphasis on coal-fired power plants as it stands now, the ETM principles apply to full spectrum of fossil fuel market segments. One of the earliest uh, cash for clunkers proposals came from the petroleum refining industry in California in the early 1990s. The U.S. Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 provided the legal foundation for emission trading for priority air pollute, pollutants. And this was the earliest uh, I, we can think of uh, uh, the principle of energy transition mechanism being utilized to bring down the emissions and control emissions. The cash for clunkers concept remains valid even today as we see in energy transition mechanism uh, in uh, the Asian, Asian Development Bank initiative. It can be applied to downstream and midstream segments, such as electric power generation, transport, including maritime shipping, and heavy industries, as well as upstream oil and gas production and coal mining. Some of the key challenges, of course, in energy transition mechanism is uh, elucidating pathways for a just transition so that energy transition mechanism has a positive outcome for people and the planet. Then the second key challenge is the identifying candidate facilities and companies for early retirement of fossil fuel assets. And the third, provision of innovative financing for ETM investment programs. These are a bit challenging for all parties, including Asian Development Bank, because we are accustomed to building infrastructure and not retiring infrastructure. ADB's major ongoing effort is promoting ETM in the VIP countries, we call them, Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines, where coal-fired power capacity has grown rapidly during the last 15 to 20 years. Each of these countries is different with respect to upstream coal mining and downstream coal use. Indonesia is the largest exporter of coal with 75 to 80% of production exported. Two of the Indonesia's biggest customers are in India and, and People's Republic of China. And as long as demand for coal remains strong in those countries, Indonesian mining companies have little incentive uh, to reduce output. The Philippines exports close to 100% of coal used for electric power generation, sorry, imports, uh, power generation and industrial uses. Vietnam is somewhere in between Indonesia and, and the Philippines with respect to domestic 
coal production and imports. Indonesia is the most advanced with respect to identification of candidate facilities for retirement as it stands now, planning for a just transition and development of multiple financing options. This is all pursued by our ETM team in ADB. ADB is also creating an important financing partnership with an initial uh, contribution of a grant of $25 million from the government of Japan and of course some philanthropies. And we are seeking additional contributions for this effort from other governments as well as non-traditional donors like philanthropies. There is no one size fits all solution, but the principles of cash for Panthers do apply across geographies, national legal systems, and socioeconomic conditions. ADB will continue to support energy transition mechanism efforts in partnership with our developing member countries. Looking ahead, as we often say, there is money for the project if there is a project for the money. With these uh, thoughts and few remarks, let me wish you all a fruitful uh, deliberation during the next one to one and a half hours. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Priyanta and John for your opening remarks, and also for highlighting the perspectives of USAID and World Bank, Asian Development Bank. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we move into the, the most exciting part of the session, which is the panel discussion, uh, let me take a few minutes uh, to further reinforce some of the points made by John and Priyanta. So if I may request uh, my team to really put up uh, the slides uh, here. Uh, great, uh, thank you. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, as we know, like most of the Asian countries has set an ambitious uh, renewable energy target uh, to drive climate action uh, for their sustainable economic growth. Uh, we have seen some significant progress in the last decade. You see the renewable energy uh, deployment has increased almost three times from uh, 479 gigawatts to uh, almost 1500 gigawatts. And corresponding to that growth, uh, the investment in the region also grew at the rate of nine to 11% in different sub-regions of Asia. Uh, while we see some decline uh, observed in the last few years, uh, which were largely impacted because of changes in the policies and, and some of the market impacts we've seen from COVID-19. Uh, you see from the graph uh, on the top left, uh, it shows the current share of renewable energy, which ranges from 20 to 30 percent of total electricity consumption, uh, except for uh, uh, 7 percent in East Asia region. Uh, what it really shows uh, that uh, the countries uh, need to move swiftly to replace the remaining 60 to 70 percent uh, fossil based generation, which you see at the bottom of the graphs. Uh, and uh, this will be critical to achieve uh, the short term 2030 goals which we're looking at, but also the long term uh, net zero uh, situation which we are all aiming for. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in addition to replacing uh, the existing fossil fuel based generation, uh, the countries also need to take care of the future increase in electricity demand, uh, which is expected to grow uh, almost by 30% in 2030 and 60% by 2040. So it's a significant increase. And if we take into account uh, the annual investment required, uh, uh, the, it will range from 800 billion to uh, uh, 1.2 uh, trillion in the whole region by 2050. Uh, it again depends on uh, different scenarios of energy transition uh, we are able to make in the region. And in that context, the first decade would be very, very critical for us to make that progress. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, looking at the scale of uh, current investments, uh, the future energy needs uh, uh, to be increased by four or five times. Uh, this is where the investments by the private sector assume uh, significance uh, as most of uh, this is expected to be financed by the private sector and public uh, uh, finance can really enable this. Uh, studies uh, show uh, kind of a, a lot of insights into this, uh, we have recently uh, conducted an assessment of uh, South Asia region uh, to look at the critical barriers. There is a study by ADB, which covered almost uh, uh, 1800 private financial institutions. And they kind of identified what are the critical barriers uh, to such, uh, uh, these investments. And it kind of uh, pointed to a few things. Uh, one is uh, the policy uncertainty, 
high upfront costs of renewable energy, longer periods to recover these investments. Uh, uh, there is also a need for higher collaterals, uh, wherein we're looking at some of the new entrepreneurs coming to this space that might be a challenge. Uh, insufficient local capital, uh, a big, big challenge. And uh, that also kind of linked to the challenges with respect to the currency race. Uh, our study, as I mentioned, also kind of identified some of these uh, similar issues. The one which uh, came out strongly is uh, the high cost of domestic capital, which has an impact on the overall tariffs we can generate. Uh, the inadequate avenues to monetize the operational assets, uh, the currency risk, again, uh, important thing. And in the region, uh, the issue of counterparty risk, uh, which largely emanate from the uh, poor financial situation of the distribution utilities, which are the primary off-taker of these things. And that is where uh, innovative financing instruments can play a very important role in addressing some of these barriers. As you see, uh, all of them kind of highlighted in the blue box. These are the things which we can address through uh, some of these instruments. The things which cannot be addressed, which have to be addressed outside, most of it relates to the policy and the global geopolitics. Uh, so if I can just kind of quickly move to the next slide, uh, John already referred to uh, some of the work which USAID has done in the region. Uh, we help uh, developing the green bonds market in India by establishing the business case for green bonds, building the capacity of banks and financial institutions and project developers in structuring some of these green bonds. And handholding a few entities in issuing green bonds in partnership uh, with the Climate Bonds Initiative. You will get to hear from Sean soon. Uh, we also help establish credit guarantees uh, with local financial institutions. Uh, we have almost $150 million worth of guarantees available with uh, the local banks and financial institutions to really drive investment uh, into new technologies, new business models. And uh, we have seen that these are pretty successful in helping these institutions to take over uh, the perceived risk. Uh, and some of these institutions are really comfortable in expanding their lending to the clean energy sector without using these guarantees. Uh, so while we are working on helping scale uh, the use of uh, uh, infrastructure investment trust, uh, that is a new thing which we have identified and we are looking at it uh, and uh, looking at how do we kind of help uh, move that uh, instrument in the country. So let me quickly introduce some of the innovative instruments uh, uh, and we'll get to hear more about them uh, from our panelists uh, very soon. Uh, so starting with uh, the first instrument, next slide please. Uh, is, is on uh, Invits. Uh, uh, this is a kind of a structure which is used globally in different forms, different names. Uh, you call them ILCOs, you call them uh, other kind of investment trusts. And it has a real huge potential in unlocking the value of existing renewable energy assets. Uh, using Invits, a developer can pull in money from diverse source of investors. That is one thing that you are able to tap new sources of investments. Uh, and allow uh, them to recycle their investment into a new projects while keeping some control over these investments. Uh, as you see, uh, uh, the future of uh, the kind of uh, inbits, uh, we have seen that uh, it's used in countries like US, UK, Australia as ELCOs. Uh, there is uh, a huge potential which we foresee in India uh, with the regulatory provisions in place. Uh, there is uh, some forward movement of uh, using these instruments by the renewable energy and the power sector, which is kind of uh, one other part of the larger infrastructure uh, investments which come into this. Uh, we also see that in India, there is uh, uh, the market for invest is expected to reach 100 billion in the next two, four, five years. So it's, it's one of the promising instruments which can be used in India, but also in other countries if you have the right regulatory provisions in place. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so quickly uh, looking at uh, the other one, uh, which is on green bonds, uh, uh, which we again feel is a really high potential uh, across Asia. Uh, there are a number of uh, financial institutions, uh, uh, institutional investors who are committed to investing into climate friendly technologies. And one of the challenges they face is establishing that their investments are green. And globally, uh, green bonds, uh, with its kind of acceptable definition of green projects, established certification process, it allows them to make these investments and address the concerns uh, with these investors are. For Asian countries, uh, this could help bring 
more international capital at a lower cost for the longer tenor, which is one of the concern uh, which we heard as a challenge for the renewable energy sector in this region. Uh, globally, uh, the green bond issuance have increased 14 times in seven years. So you can see how fast this is kind of moving. Uh, the cumulative uh, issuance stand around 1.6 trillion. And 23% of these green bonds are issued in countries uh, like China, Japan, uh, in, in the Asian region, and these countries have taken the benefit of it. And we've seen that countries like India, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam have a really high potential uh, to utilize this instrument in coming years. Uh, we've seen some good progress happening in India. And there are efforts by country governments uh, to really issue sovereign green bonds uh, and other similar instruments to drive more local investment uh, from different sources. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, one other instrument uh, which is gaining some popularity in India is uh, alternate investment funds. Uh, it is a privately pooled investment vehicle which collects from, from investors, whether Indian or foreign, for investing into projects in according uh, the definition which uh, is defined by the investment uh, fund itself. Uh, it's kind of a structure. It provides a lot of flexibility in terms of restructuring of debt payments and provisioning uh, and assumes significant importance uh, looking at the needs of the small medium enterprises or startups uh, uh, who have a kind of a variable or inconsistent cash flows as compared to the traditional uh, debt, debt instruments like loans, which would uh, definitely look for uh, continuous uh, payments on a regular intervals. In India, uh, there are specific regulations which establish uh, to stop, uh, uh, kind of uh, structure alternate investment funds uh, to protect the interest of investors uh, and also limit the risk from them. Uh, we will get to hear uh, some of it uh, from one of our panelists uh, today uh, from Caspian Impact Investment. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, I'll just quickly go through this and not get into details, uh, but these are two important issues. Uh, one is currency hedging costs, uh, which really vary between uh, 6 to 8 uh, percent and has a significant impact on the overall cost of capital, which again translate into the direct to the customers. Uh, these, uh, there are various ways we can address this. Uh, we can also find ways through which we can reduce the cost of uh, currency hedging, uh, which can really enable a large volume of international capital to flow at a lower rate to the project developers. Uh, similarly, the credit guarantees, uh, especially the first loss reduction, it could be really powerful uh, in unlocking the domestic investment in the clean energy projects. So uh, that's kind of a very broad context, adding a little more flavor to what John and uh, Prent has spoke about. Uh, let's kind of transition uh, to the next part of the event, uh, which is the panel discussion. Uh, so uh, I'm really delighted to welcome and introduce the panelists. Uh, I would also request all of them to switch on their cameras and uh, they can use the microphone while they're speaking. Uh, my uh, first panelist, uh, Mr. Sean Kidney, uh, CEO of Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, Mr. Harsha, uh, CEO of Integrate Investment Trust. Uh, Ms. Karen Litwin, a senior energy specialist with Global Climate Fund. Uh, Ms. Nancy Nagun, uh, PFAN Network Manager. And Mr. Abhishek Gupta. Uh, CEO of uh, Caspian Impact Investment Fund. Uh, so uh, I would like to start uh, by inviting uh, the panelists to provide uh, some kind of opening high-level overview about uh, their work uh, in four to five minutes, and then we'll lead into uh, a follow-on question and answer. And uh, to really make it really interactive, I will encourage all the participants to use a Q&A option uh, at the bottom of uh, your screen, uh, put your questions, also mention your name, and also refer to the uh, specific uh, panelists to whom the question is intended for. Uh, we will try to address your questions during the session, but in case we are uh, short of time, we will follow up on responses from panelists through emails. Uh, so uh, let's start with uh, inviting Mr. Sean Kidney. Uh, Sean, uh, as we understand, green bonds have a really uh, high potential in helping Asian countries driving clean energy deployment. And uh, can you uh, kind of uh, throw some light on the specific advantages of green bonds for Asian countries, uh, the market potential of green bonds in Asia, and any success stories uh, uh, you have to share with the participants to encourage the use of green bonds. Uh, you have five minutes. Over to you, Sean. Thanks, Anurag. Uh, 
and thanks for having me on the panel today. Well, you've said it a lot in your introductory comments. This is a thematic market designed to match buyers and sellers interested in green, very simple, which is growing at an unbelievable rate globally, fastest growing asset class on the planet, except cryptocurrencies who have now gone down the chute. <laughs> so we're doing well so far. It's a, it's a very simple idea. All it is, is a way of linking those investors who are concerned around future portfolio risks they might have around climate change and are looking to see if they can shift their uh, portfolios over to be more uh, addressing these kinds of changes to those people who've got projects or rather assets to refinance or finance that will qualify. It's a very simple idea. You know, someone, often people ask me, well, what's special about a green bond? And I say, well, look, it all is is debt. You're asking your aunt for money to borrow a car. Your aunt says, can you make sure that it's electric car because of the future? And you say, yes, of course, I'm going to make sure electric car. That's what I got. And I'm going to take you for a drive every year in Diwali to show you how fantastic it is. And that's a green bond. It's as simple as that. Now, because it's so simple, a lot of portfolio managers, fund managers, are finding it a very attractive proposition to talk with their clients about. So when we talk to our major international investors, the State Streets, the Fidelities, the Black Rocks of the World, who are part of our partnership program, they tell us that their clients get it because it's simple and they understand it. And there isn't necessarily, there's certainly not upfront, a sacrifice of price because you're saving the planet. I'll come back to the price in a minute, though, but there are some benefits here. So this kind of tool is first and foremost a way of attracting new investors who have these kind of interests, which now do constitute the bulk of the world's global investor market. They've all got large mandated funds. A lot of them are trying to switch to the mainstream funds. The reinsurance companies, for example, are not using mandates. They're saying we want to populate our normal fund 10%, 20% green. And that's the driver behind this. Hence these figures. In fact, it's, a, it's above 1.6 trillion now. Up to, we've just got to 1.8 trillion outstanding under rug. And uh, we're going to see issuance this year of somewhere between 700 and 800 billion dollars uh, US equivalent, uh, which is a substantial growth from last year and it keeps going up. It's populated not just by energy companies, to be clear, although clean energy has been the largest slice this market. It's um, railway companies, IRFC in, in India, for example. It's sovereigns, the Indian government is coming to market soon of a green sovereign. And it's uh, all sorts of entities, including ABS. One of the largest private or semi-private issues in the world is Fannie Mae, which is property, green property in the US. Because there are so many different kinds of issuers, this market is very liquid. For international investors, this is a very important attraction if you're trying to issue into this market. They can chop and change green with green, they can sell quickly, the secondary market is very strong for green bonds, and that means they want more supply got to do it. And the secondary market um, characteristics are very important here. Whenever we see a downturn in the global green bond market, and I'm specifically referring to hard currencies, but it does apply to a bunch of other currencies as well, we see these bonds holding their value. Now, Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock, once said that he didn't make money by giving his investors yield. He made money by making sure they never lost their money. It's a fundamentally defensive proposition, fixed income investing. And if you've got a product, which is what a green bond is, which is less likely to lose value in a downturn, this is gold dust. And that has driven in hard currency, secondary market differential and pricing. So green bonds are a premium product now, anywhere between five basis points for a AAA German bond to 75 basis points differential for the Egyptian sovereign to give you a, a sense of the scale. And that translates, of course, to primary pricing. Now, I, I remember a conversation I had some years ago of David, David Roskina, when he was the head of the Indian Export, uh, Indian Export Import Bank. He was the first green bond issuer in uh, public issue uh, in uh, India. And he said to me, look, I didn't get any price benefit on my first bond, but you know, I got 17% new investors to the book only 
Nowadays, the figure is usually 50% or 60%. percent got 70%. You don't think I can't extract a couple of basis points? Of course I can. He was treasurer at that time. And he says, I chose not to do it on the first bond. I wanted to leave the difference on the table because I wanted to make them loyal. You know, that's a treasurer strategy. But the point is, diversification and getting new investors is the norm in this market. And that applies to domestic as well. Right? But we haven't seen a lot of domestic issuance in the Indian market. And we haven't seen issuance in the other markets so much. But certainly overseas, domestic has been very popular. You know, we're all we're blinded a bit by the war in, in Ukraine at the moment. So Russia's off the, not so much on the agenda. But I'll tell you, even in Russia, last year I did a panel with the deputy mayor of Moscow. And they just issued a $700 million equivalent green bond in rubles. And he was telling me they got a 20 basis points benefit in the Russian ruble markets of all places, which really blew me away and surprised. So this is appearing everywhere because people are seeing them as more valuable and more defensive. So that's the background. Now, this is not going to save you 5% interest on your refinancing, but it is going to make the refinancing, I stress refinancing because project finance is going to be in three ways, right? Either you're going to get some equity, you're going to get a, a friendly bank loan, or you're going to have enough internal capital or assets to refinance to be able to raise capital to build a new. Let's, let's be realistic about that. So there's some form of refinancing involved in here. But if you can exit quickly or if you can refinance and raise capital institutional investors quickly out of this, this does wonders for the project pipeline and exercising, energizing the project pipeline. So I'm not going to say this is useful for small solar developers. This is, or this is useful for larger companies. And let's look at the names we've issued in, in India. We've seen uh, Azure, sure. we've seen Greenco, yeah. we've seen Adani Green Energy and so on. And they're the ones that have shown how successful it is and they keep doing it. So that's really what it is. The doing it is pretty simple. The technique is you have to prove that you've got green assets, You've got to get an independent review, preferably a cloud bond certification. Talk to me afterwards. I'll talk to, I'll talk to you about that. And then you issue in the market. The cost structure is very low, especially if you're a clean energy producer, because the assets are pretty straightforward. So my question really is, if you're able to issue a bond, you know, you've got to have the credit worthiness and so on, then you're mad, you know, why aren't you doing this? You're mad if you're not. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I think uh, we, we had a, a really good insights into green bonds. Uh, now, uh, we'll come back uh, to you with some follow up on that. Uh, and I again encourage everyone, uh, uh, if you have questions, please put it on the Q&A chat box uh, on the screen. Uh, so uh, moving on to uh, our uh, kind of a next panelist, uh, Harsh, uh, and it was a real pleasure to hearing you uh, at the Invit event two weeks ago. And uh, uh, thanks for your participation there. Uh, for our participants, uh, if you can briefly explain what are Invit's, uh, their unique advantages compared to other instruments, and what are the key learnings or experience of the Integrate journey, uh, uh, and if you have any thoughts about the potential of this instrument for other Asian countries. You have five minutes. Over to you, Ash. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us, uh, Rag, and thank you all the participants. I think... Uh, to, to start with your second question, I think uh, India was behind the curve in terms of launching a yield vehicle platform in comparison to the other Asian countries. Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand and, and had already a good yield platform already listed. So India started in 2016-17 with uh, Invits and REITs, which is nothing but a yield core or a business trust or an MLP as it is called in different structure as you mentioned. Globally it's been a very mature market with over about 400 odd listing with over trillion dollars of assets under management for different kind of asset classes and what India has done is just replicated what is best what has worked well in Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, UK and the US and picked up those regulations and launched those uh, launches in which leads in India in 2017. Since then, till now, <clears throat> there is about, I would say, uh, about $25 billion of assets under management between different in which and REITs, which I would say is a great 
success for Indian policymakers and infrastructure owners and real estate owners because to have this kind of scale for any financial innovation in the first five years is phenomenal. Different kind of uh, uh, asset classes within renewable, uh, within transmission, power, road, real estate have, have actually launched their inbits and REITs with private sponsors to public sponsor. And I would say most of the global investors uh, have chosen in which it reads as a way of investing in India when they want to own infrastructure assets. Now coming to why. Why is because the way the regulations are structured is uh, they have fixed a minimum payout ratio, which makes it a yield platform, mandatory distributions. They have fixed maximum leverage, uh, 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 consolidated leverage the platforms can take, which means the uh, usual ill of infrastructure assets in India elsewhere is kind of prevented with cap on a leverage. Uh, there's been consistent valuation reports and high disclosure norms, just like any other listed company. Uh, there is a wide participation depending on the choice of the investor, whether they want to do a public platform or a private platform. Uh, and a public capital can be tapped in if it is a publicly listed vehicle. And many of them, including state-owned transco, has chosen that. Uh, their corporate governance norms are fairly stringent. Uh, they run like, a, I would say, a, a listed company with I would say, a little more disclosure norms and governance requirements as in a, in a, uh, unlike a listed company. So in general, it is a, a well-governed, well-drafted regulatory policy uh, to, to enable in which REITs in India to own assets. Within the clean energy space, there have been only two platforms which are owning uh, green energy assets. Uh, if I include power grid uh, transmission assets, probably three. So there is power grid in which, Indy grid in which, which owns both uh, solar assets as well as uh, transmission assets. And the third one is Virisint in which, which is uh, pure play renewable energy in which. So it took some time for the first clean energy assets to list. And even for Indigo, who is listed for five years, it took, took some time to acquire a first clean energy assets. But I think it's just the beginning. And considering the experience that investors have got, uh, the uh, amount of assets that requires recycling new capital in India, we believe that it is going to spread extremely fast. And uh, we will see, you know, another, if, God forbid, we will be looking at more than 50 to $100 billion of assets under management between in which it's very soon in the next five to seven years. So that's the outlook that I'm leaving with. Uh, would, would love to address questions uh, subsequently. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh, uh, for your kind of uh, opening comments. And I will come back to you with some follow-up questions as we start receiving uh, questions from the participants. Uh, and we also have a few uh, other questions from her side. So uh, now I'm kind of uh, delighted to invite uh, Ms. Uh, Karen Litwin uh, from the Green Climate Fund, uh, which is the world's largest climate fund mandated to support developing countries uh, to raise and realize their uh, climate commitments. Uh, and uh, my request uh, to you, Karen, if you can please inform our participants more about GCF, uh, what has been achieved so far, uh, and what GCF is planning in the future, particularly that relates to clean energy transition and uh, any Asia specific information would be highly valuable. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, Anurag, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this distinguished panel and speak with everyone today. I'm here to talk about my favorite topic, that is the role and the operations of the Green Climate Fund. As many of you may know, uh, GCF is the world, world's largest climate fund. It brings together players across the public and private sectors to unlock, unlock finance at scale, and in particular to catalyze green markets beyond the GCF finance. Uh, Anurag spoke about the, gave us a long list of the barriers. That's exactly why we're here, to address those barriers. We partner with national regional and international organizations and financiers, but also with technical experts, expert organizations. Um, 
you we work through what is called the credited entity. So any entity can apply to GCF and become accredited, and we will channel financing through the accredited entities. So a bit of history. GCF approved this first project in 2015 as the Paris Agreement was concluded. And today, we have commitments of over $10.4 billion across nearly 200 projects. And the leverage of that is 28.4 billion in co-financing. So to move this closer to the Asia Pacific region, we currently have 82 projects across the Asia and Pacific region amounting to 3.7 billion. That's a relatively large share in GCF financing. And that has mobilized 12.9 billion in co-financing. So that gives you a bit of perspective of how quickly GCF has moved and where we stand today. We, of course, have ambitions to move a lot faster in the coming years. So let me just briefly introduce to you what the areas are that we invest in. We have eight areas, and I'm gonna talk about the three largest, and the largest one is energy generation and access. The second largest one is building cities and industry and appliances, so energy efficiency falls under that. And this is then followed by forest and land use. The energy sector is not only our largest sector with commitments amounting to 2.8 billion globally, but th this is also where we have the largest share of our private sector projects, which is more than half of that financing. Globally, overall, 35% of GCF's investments are deployed from our private sector facility. So what is important for GCF? It is really about the pathways and the transformation in the sector or in the subsector. And what we particularly look at is what is the impact on mitigation and or adaptation. So mitigation in terms of CO2 emissions reductions, or it can be cross-cutting or standalone as an adaptation. So what weather events do we mitigate? Can we help resilience on the grid, for instance, to withstand some of the increased weather events? That would be typical adaptation projects. So we have a, an aim to have 50-50 between mitigation of our financing committed is 50-50 across adaptation and mitigation. And where do we stand today? Today, we're slightly weighted towards mitigation, and that has its natural explanation. I told you that the energy sector is the largest sector, and it has historically been very much about a mitigation uh, subsector, but people forget that grid investments that my colleague before here spoke about is cannot also be adaptation. So we're moving on those areas. So I'll stop here for now, and I hope I've given you a very brief overview or GCF at a glance, and then I look forward to getting into much more discussion about the financing instruments, and particularly what was mentioned here, what can we do on the bond side? Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Uh, so the Private Financing Advisory Network, or PFAN, uh, has helped investment facilitation to entrepreneurs uh, developing climate and clean energy projects in the emerging markets. So I'm pleased to now uh, invite Nancy, uh, if you can briefly introduce PFAN and what has been achieved so far uh, in the Asian region. Over to you, Nancy. Hi, um, uh, hello friends and, and colleagues. Thank you, Anurag and uh, the Sareb team for hosting this event and for giving me the opportunity to introduce PFAN and its work in clean and climate financing. 
So what is PFAN? So uh, PFAN stands for Private Financing Advisory Network. So when people think about PFAN, many people think we are investing, but actually we are a global network of climate and clean energy financing experts. So we are now uh, operating in four continents, in Central America and Caribbean, uh, in Africa, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, um, and, in, and finally Asia and the Pacific. So in Asia, we are operating in five South Asian countries, including Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. For Southeast Asia, we are operating in five, seven countries, including Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Indonesia, Myanmar, Malaysia, and the Philippines. So we ha now have about over across the, uh, the network, we have about 200 climate and clean energy and finance experts. So what is the problem that PFAN is uh, addressing? So one of the noticeable trends in the renewable energy sector and also uh, climate adaptation is that investors struggle to find uh, good businesses to invest. And many, not many investors are familiar with certain technology and business model. So it's oftentimes it's difficult for them to uh, sourcing and identify well-developed bankable project uh, proposal to invest. Meanwhile, many entrepreneurs find it difficult to raise uh, capital. Uh, a lot of them um, don't have a, a sufficient financial and commercial skills to actually um, develop a good proposal, uh, make it sound attractive to investors. So, um, so what PFN doing is we uh, we doing um, matchmaking. How we we conduct um, different activities to connect these two parties together. So put it simply that we try to make uh, these two parties get interested to each other. Um, eventually go on the date and, and fall in love with each other and then uh, get married. So that's what PFAN is doing. So, um, so PFAN um, started in 2006 under the Climate in a, uh, Technology Initiative. And um, right now PFAN, since uh, 2016, PFAN has been hosted by UNIDO and the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership, RIP. And all the funding for, uh, for PFAN activities coming from the governments of Australia, Austria, Japan, Norway, Sweden, and uh, also USAID, and as well as from the Kigali Cooling Program. So how PFAN works? So like I uh, said earlier, that uh, we uh, support um, uh, project developers to develop a clear identification of target customer and resulting re uh, revenue streams. We help them to uh, develop an operational and scalable business plan and uh, design a coherent investment structure and the ability to uh, communicate with investors. So um, all the uh, donor funding is uh, gonna be gonna uh, pay for the advisory uh, 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 services and all our advisor would get some um, uh, success fee if the project uh, are successfully raised uh, capital. And uh, we rely on a, a network of investor and network partners. And um, we uh, uh, intend to um, leverage. So every uh, one, every dollar of uh, donor uh, support, we. Um, leverage the uh, about $60 of investment. So um, uh, for all the projects that coming for uh, applying for PFAN support um, usually have a, um, are looking to raise funding between 500,000 to 50 million. And uh, we also have a smaller project looking for around uh, 200 million to, uh, sorry, 200,000 to 500,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, and this project typically on the uh, uh, energy access. So most project that uh, PFAN supports is uh, uh, focusing first on um, traditional um, clean energy uh, projects 
for, for instance, um, solar energy efficiency. Um, and uh, two years ago, uh, we also uh, expand our activity supporting any project that have climate adaptation and resilience benefits, including ecotourism or project on a sustainable agriculture. So, um, so far we have supported about uh, more than 1000 projects and now across the uh, network, we have more than 500 uh, projects in, in the pipeline. And since uh, 2006, we have helped to leverage about 1.4 billion and we're hoping to get to achieve to 3 billion soon. And um, we have helped uh, more than 200 project uh, raise financing. So uh, this slide show the uh, project that coming to PFAN support. And you will see here, even during the pandemic where a lot of businesses are, were struggling and uh, some of them even closed down uh, their project, we still have a good number of projects coming into um, uh, for uh, asking for PFAN support and have a need to raise financing. And uh, uh, this slide shows the uh, project that reaching financial closure uh, since 2018. And here um, in Asia, particularly uh, during the two years of pan pandemic, 2020 and 2021, uh, we have a very good number of projects um, still uh, be able to raise finance. For instance, in uh, 2020, we, we helped uh, 18 projects to raise about 100 million uh, US dollar and in 2021, we help uh, uh, 25 projects to raise about close to 200 uh, uh, um, million US dollars. So we now in Asia, uh, the PFAN pipeline has about uh, more than 200 projects. Most of them are focusing on solar, um, on energy efficiency um, and clean transport. We, have, we also have a good number of projects that have adaptation benefits. And most of PFAN projects are right now uh, are looking for uh, financing between 1 million to 5 million. And um, the total project um, we are in the pipeline now presenting close to more than 2 billion of investment. So um, that's a brief introduction about PFAN and um, I'm uh, happy to answer all the questions uh, you might have and uh, looking forward to the um, interactive in, and interesting uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, so USAID has uh, worked uh, very closely with uh, Caspian in the last five years. And now we are also collaborating to help Caspian design and implement a climate focus alternate investment fund uh, targeting small uh, and medium enterprises. Uh, so uh, let me invite Abhishek from Caspian. Uh, Abhishek, you can tell us why Caspian chose uh, alternate investment fund for the proposed climate smart debt fund. And if you can briefly touch on the role of small and medium enterprises in the clean energy transition and what challenges they face concerning uh, raising finance and where does this AIF really fit into addressing those challenges? Over to you, Abhishek. Sure. Thank you so much, Anurag. Now, uh, whenever you talk about climate or energy finance, the mental image that all of us get is those large scale solar plants or those windmills, you know, grand and beautiful. But we realize that uh, for accelerated and deep climate positive impact, uh, climate finance actually has to reach out to a much wider variety of technologies and use cases. And these are technologies and use cases that are essentially developed by uh, startups or innovative companies, which are technically SMEs in nature. And hence often untouched by the traditional financing sources. Now we know for sure that there is a large group of capital providers globally who are interested in deploying capital into uh, climate positive opportunities but they don't get the options to deploy beyond these solar power plants and the uh, windmills because nobody has really done an active work at scale uh, to be able to curate these opportunities and make them available uh, to the investors. Now, given the urgency of the climate 
impact that we are facing, we realize that as an impact investor, Caspian debt has a big role to play in being able to curate these varied opportunities to capital providers uh, so that they're able to finance. Now, this entire process is, uh, in, in our opinion, actually consists of three major steps. First one being able to identify the opportunities, which is basically a combination of new technologies and delivery models that create climate positive impact. Second is, as a in local impact investor, financing them across their life cycle. And lastly, continuously create new structures that enable all these different types of capital providers to come in, capital, come in and provide capital at the right time. Uh, that's the reason why we uh, we've decided to set up the alternative or use the AIF uh, route. Now, the reason why we chose the AIF is there are multiple reasons, but uh, before I talk about the reasons, I'll probably give you a little bit of a context on the question that you were asking about the challenges that SMEs face, especially uh, climate or clean technology startups, the kind of problems that they face. Now, the uh, issue is that, uh, and in a, in a way, I guess I've had the, uh, we've had the privilege through Caspian Debt to support a lot of these companies. Now we've, and, and all of what I'm gonna say is gonna be uh, based on that experience. Now we've funded every type of company from those companies making say solar powered pumps to micro solar powered micro coal storages to energy efficient fans to uh, electric uh, three wheelers, water energy resource efficiency companies and so on. Now, one of the key issues that we've seen time and time again is traditional financial institutions in India do not find these companies interesting to be financed. So if they want to finance them, it would, they would either get financed under some scheme, otherwise they are not of interest to traditional banks and NBFCs in India. Which means that these companies have to go out and raise equity capital, which is very, which is not very easy to raise a lot of the time, especially in a sector like, uh, you know, climate or energy finance. It's hip and cool these days, but still all the money typically goes into one or two large opportunities. A lot of the larger number of uh, companies are left out. A lot of these companies are uh, building technology and delivery models that have a longer gestation period. These companies in our experience that we've seen uh, takes, each of them take about five to six years to get to a reasonable scale. And this is after they have developed a product and done some sales. So these are not equity opportunities. These are debt opportunities. And yet they don't get financed. We are potentially the only financier. I think we have been the largest financier for climate technology or clean technology companies in India till date. Uh, uh, and overall, we've funded uh, close to 200 companies across different sectors, out of which clean technologies and climate smart, if I add together, I think we would have already financed 60. But we've done all these financings from an NBFC or a non-bank finance institution vehicle, which actually uh, is limiting when it comes to the kind of flexibilities that we can provide in terms of the financing that we provide to all these companies. And that is where we wanted to set up the AIF so that we can continue with, you know, identify companies early, help them with financing at an early stage and continue life cycle financing when they were much larger in size. It also enables us to blend capital from different sources because we know their uh, investors are interested across the capital spectrum to invest into this asset class. Risk layering is possible. So we are trying to see how we can layer the risk, bring in credit enhancement uh, in, into the structure so that appropriate returns can be given to the appropriate type of investor. This also enables us, which is more like a multi-sector debt uh, provider or investor, to create thematic opportunities and att attract investors who have specific interest in the climate smart space to come in and work with us. And I think that that is what has encouraged us to set up an AI vehicle uh, so that through this vehicle, we can provide everything from term loans to venture debt kind of products to subordinated debt or quasi equity kind of debt products to high potential, high impact entrepreneurial companies uh, that can 
develop and scale clean technologies that can then help us create a significant climate positive impact and future uh, before disaster strikes us. So that was the con context of premise based on which we decided to go the AI route, Anurag. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. So uh, let's move on to a Q&A. We have some questions which are coming from the participants. I encourage uh, more such questions coming up. Uh, uh, but uh, just staying here, Abhishek, uh, if you uh, tell us a little more of what kind of impact uh, Caspian is uh, expecting to create through uh, this uh, alternate investment fund. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like I said, there are there are multiple layers that we as an impact investor, we figured that we could bring in, bring into it. So one of the things, of course, is being able to support at least 20 uh, different or 10, 20, 20 different climate smart companies bringing in new climate technologies or delivery models. We want that 40% of the companies that we fund out of this fund uh, should be women-led or women-managed. So we are trying to add a little bit of a gender lens to it as well, because in our experience of investing into uh, social enterprises, startups, and financial institutions over all these years, and like I said, we funded 200 of them, a little more than 200 of them, uh, we realized that the gender theme is largely ignored by mainstream investors, and we, as an impact investor, has a role to play. So we want to do that. Uh, we want to support at least four new technologies. That's the additional uh, thing that we want to do. And there are a plethora of details, Anurag, as you know, but those were the high level uh, aspects. Great, thank you so much, Abhishek. So uh, let me uh, pick up uh, a question from, from the participants uh, and uh, also add one from my side. Uh, and this is for both Sean uh, as well as Harsh. Uh, uh, so very specific to the climate bonds thing, uh, the question is about uh, uh, these bonds have a great, great potential to provide debt of pool for SMEs in the clean energy investment across the region. Uh, uh, what you have learned in terms of barriers to commercial banks in developing and issuing green bonds? So this is a very specific question about green bonds, which uh, uh, Sion, you can address. But the other bigger question for uh, both you and Hirsch is, uh, uh, as you interact with a lot of investors, uh, what kind of investors would be interesting in investing into uh, these instruments we've talked about, green bonds, invits, or the alternate investment fund, which uh, Abhishek has spoken about, and why uh, they would be interested in this? Like, what is their motivation to do that? So it's a long question, but maybe starting with Sean and then moving to Hush. Over. Well, in some ways, the answer is very simple. If you can work out the credit worthiness. Uh, that's back to your comments earlier, Anurag, about the sort of support USAID is providing around all this. Then it's easy to issue. If you can issue in the international market, there is demand there. It's a it's a bottomless well of demand. But to be able to do that, you've got to address a few things. You do have to address hedging, currency risk, and that is a challenge, as we know. Um, there are a variety of organizations trying to support that, including, by the way, the India Exim Bank that provides some very cost efficient hedging for small, for certain classes of deals. Um, we've got TCX, which is the Dutch government and European Commission funded hedging facility, which are providing longer tenor hedging uh, in India. And I say that because, of course, the second thing is tenor. Um, hedging, hedging issues make tenor issues really difficult. Um, uh, renewable energy developers or rather um, owners of assets would typically prefer to do a long tenor bond than a short tenor bond which is very difficult for them at the moment in the international market so but there are solutions around there and then of course underpinning all of this is or un underneath all of this is the the nature of the credit worthiness of the, of the institution itself i mean if you're lucky enough to be f owned 40 percent by temasek in singapore it's a lot easier for you but, and you know who I mean, but if you are a small entity, then uh, work has to be done. But there are guaranteed facilities and support around, and USAID has a, has a great program in this area. I'm going to say other agencies are now stepping up as well. Uh, we've seen ADB, we've seen the uh, guarantee, the Garant Co company and so on also start offering these kinds of things. So there is some choice around. 
there's a cost in a guarantee. It's not cost free. And so you have to make sure that the cost balances out the savings, but it gives you access to a pool that you may not get access to at all otherwise. So even if the pricing ends up being the same, remember that investor diversification, you've got a lot more investors to choose from and to rope in, which then has a consequent benefit. That's not very helpful if you're a single time issuer. And I'm going to say green bonds may not be the use useful thing for single time issuers. They're designed for people who are going to be issuing again and again and again. In the domestic market, we have seen in the Indian domestic market, I should say, we've seen some green bond issuance. And my friends at Hero Future Energy think they get a, a differential price, the secondary market, a better price, the secondary market. I'm not sure all the data is there, but it's great to hear a treasurer saying that. So the reason I've been what we haven't seen is enough issuance. There's to, there, there just hasn't been enough supply to flush out the demand. I've had the CEO of Life Insurance Corporation of India on a panel with me saying, I want green bonds, I love them, but we're just not getting supply. So folks, it may be, and you know, early days, we've got to prove this, it may be some credit support from a USA for a domestic issuance could be a sweet spot. I forget, and that'll avoid the currency hedging. I'm pushing the Indian government with their sovereign green bond program to issue in INR but make it available for overseas investors as well as domestic. Now, that'll be useful because that'll provide some liquidity and some benchmark pricing, which should help development of the market for, for everyone. Uh, but the credit risks are the same and discount risk, well, I won't go there. Aye, 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 aye. <laughs> you know what they are. You know what those issues are. There's no surprises there. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Harsh, if I may invite your response to this question. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to address if I answer your question rightly. I think, see, the, there are two, three types of investors who are choosing to invest into assets via in which and reads and even Pravishek's platform AIF. It includes institutional investor, which are domestic institutions. It includes retail and it includes uh, foreign investors. And I think all three of them are at a different level of maturity in terms of investing into green assets uh, from their uh, own prerogatives. I mean, the first one starting from global investors, I haven't come across a global fund who is investing in infrastructure, leave aside clean energy, who has got a mandate not to invest in non-clean energy assets. So essentially, if there is a coal power plant in India today, it's only being funded by domestic capital and not by international capital. So now that is getting driven by the global commitments that are made by different countries and uh, awareness and overall, I would say, uh, the journey towards moving towards you know climate financing or rather green financing as a route. So I think it's rather the negative way. So the global funds have a mandate where not to invest in non-clean energy. That leaves the clean energy as a way to invest. Right? So that that kind of directs the capital towards this direction. Within the domestic funds uh, that they invest in, I would say they they are behind the curve because they are restricted to opportunities in the country and substantial amount of opportunities are not necessarily green energy opportunities. However, considering that uh, most amount of global funds are not investing into, let's say, non-ESG compliant or non-green energy businesses, they know that the price appreciation and sustainability is getting impacted and therefore gradually the movement and the register is changing even from uh, domestic uh, fund houses perspective where they are moving their capital to uh, green or ESG compliant businesses and not necessarily and therefore you would see uh, commercially viable businesses not really trading that well because the capital providers and the institutional investors are moving away which reduces the multiple at which the companies were trading at so that's that's on the domestic side. on the retail side I would say we we uh, we are pretty behind in that the last investor. I think uh, a normal investor on the ground still looks at uh, returns more importantly than uh, necessarily green or coal coal or other energies. But I think that is a matter of time. It will evolve now once the once that once the cascading happens from the global funds to domestic funds, which does nothing but channelizing Indian capital. 
Uh, I think retail uh, psyche will eventually also follow the same method. And, and, and then there are many examples that you see it in India besides just uh, which are non-green businesses. Coal India, you know, as a big example, monopoly supplier, largest supplier, largest coal mine in the world. And, and still they're trading at very, very poor multiples. The reason being investors are not ready to pay high multiples. And even though people keep buying it, the multiples are suppressed and there are innumerable businesses like that now. So I think uh, effectively it, it, the journey has started. Obviously it's going to take time to really uh, move towards the destination, but across the investor class, we have seen the journey started in this direction. Thank you, Harsh. Uh, uh, let me uh, move on and take a few follow-up questions for Carol and Nancy. Uh, but in the meantime, I will request our panelists to really think about uh, some solutions you have or you have seen or experience in terms of addressing the hedging risk, which is coming out again and again in number of discussions. Uh, I know we can't really address that issue here, but if you have any thoughts you'd like to share with the audience. Uh, so let's move on to Carol. And we have two questions for you. Uh, one is uh, a question which relates to how GCF can really reach the small medium enterprises and the second is uh, what is the nature of financing which gcf brings whether it's debt equity blended concession finance or yeah thank you anurag and thank you uh, uh for 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 the questions um i think there's two ways that we have done it and we're open to looking into new ways one is we have access entities that are regional and local. This means that they could be national development that banks, they can also be private sector in the particular country. It could be a bank that is located within a country that wants to have an outreach for SMEs. For instance, it could be deployment of rooftop solar or mini grids uh, it could be cook stoves. We see a lot of projects like this. Uh, so that would be one way. I do believe that the, the size of the projects, we need to bundle those. Uh, because going through a process with GCF for a million dollars, that is not worth it. Uh, it needs to be a bundle of projects. So we would, let's say you are a developer, and you have some small projects, we would then help you put you in contact with uh, an entity that's accredited in that country, or it could be a regional one, depending on what's available. Uh, and then that accredited entity would look at bundling many projects. So that would be to reach a, a, a threshold, maybe above $10 million, it would be. Um, Another way that we are doing more and more, particularly from the private sector window, is we do funds. And these are funds typically that operate on a regional or on a global level. They have, they invest in uh, medium to small scale renewable energy projects. So that means that we, we have done a number of energy funds, we're still doing them, but also in the transport now, now there's one for, for India that you may have seen that was approved at the last board for, for the transport sector for e-mobility. Uh, the fund manager is uh, Macquire and they, they will operate in India. So that would be one example. But that is the two ways that we to date have reached the SME sector. Uh, and to work with funds like Caspian Debt, that is something that we would like to do because they it's really about catalyzing the local markets for, for climate finance, not just the international markets. So yes, the World Bank is also accredited and ADB is accredited with GCF, but we have a mandate from our board today to work with the local and regional entities much more than we have done in the past. So, so that means it's about catalyzing the local financial markets. Thanks, uh, Carol. So uh, turning on to Nancy, you mentioned that uh, PFAN really marry uh, the investors and the 
enterprises together. So if you can just kind of quickly maybe highlight the top three challenges uh, investors see in terms of investing in the Asia region. So um, thank you, Anurag, uh, for the question. Um, so for PFAN, uh, have, have been uh, operate in the have been operating in the market for the past ten years. We see uh, like on the both side of uh, the both side have a challenges. So for clean uh, tech entrepreneurs, um, we see that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs have backgrounds in technology. But um, but then they don't necessarily have a uh, um, knowledge um, to be able to uh, develop a sophisticated um, business model uh, and to raise funds for, uh, on their own. And um, and typically we see like a lot of entrepreneurs focusing on the application of technology to solve a particular problem and not necessarily pay attention to understand market forces, identify customers, and uh, developing a business model to apply and scale up the technology among a group of commercial customers. They also lack of a clear operational plan for de delivering the products or the services that they want to develop. Um, and, then, and then they also lack of understanding uh, of fundamental issues related to finance, uh, raising finance, including how to uh, assess the, their cap working capital and determine the optimal funding path for their projects. Uh, whether they, um, they are looking, what type of funding they are looking for, like whether equity for, uh, debt or debt or, or both, or uh, when should be the time to, to raise for uh, what type of funding. Um, and and the, their ability to understand the basics and importance of proper equity valuation. And also, um, like um, Avisa just mentioned, uh, one of the things that um, uh, become a challenge for uh, um, small size entrepreneurs is the access uh, uh, strategy, how to manage dilution when um, uh, um, current investor uh, exists and new investor coming into the pictures. So um, just an example, like two weeks ago, I looking at the uh, uh, proposal from the Philippines uh, to build a municipal solid uh, waste uh, treatment. And the developers asked for the investment of 50 million. Uh, the proposal looked good, but then when, uh, but then, uh, when I look at Further, there are a lot of fundamental questions about this uh, business model are left unanswered. For example, so the developers asking for 50 million, but they haven't even put any equity in the projects. And then uh, they don't have land to build the, the facility. They don't have any permit for uh, construction operations. Um, they, don't, uh, they don't have, a, a, for instance, like um, a supplier because uh, feed stock, feed stock uh, is very important for this type of project and they don't have a supplier contracts, they don't even have an off-taker contracts. So that's all of, uh, all of fundamental questions, how to prepare a complete investment package and develop an attractive business plan has been appear um, to be a, a challenge for many uh, entrepreneurs. And on the other side, um, from investment, uh, from an investor point of view, um, you also uh, we we have heard from other panelists already. Um, the 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 main point is for investor is to how to um, have a good qual uh, qual to see a good business uh, plan with uh, good quality data to facilitate and underpin uh, quality investment decisions. And even though um, different investors uh, have a different uh, requirements, uh, for instance, like impact investor, like uh, Avisa has already uh, mentioned uh, that they are seeking a specific social benefit and venture or meanwhile venture cap investors focusing on 
um, to seek uh, to highly scalable company and they're looking for a high energy, super talented, intelligent team to uh, scalable or commercialize a, a certain innovative ideas or uh, corporate investors is like for, want to have a credit rating for loan structure or if, if they want to invest in equity, then they're looking for a strong and a growing uh, balance sheet. And for PFAN, uh, after some time operating in the market, we see that there's some common things that investors are looking for and they haven't really seen in the in the most of business model. So first of all is a, a clear identification of target customers and resulting uh, revenue streams. Second thing is uh, an uh, operational and scalable business model, how these products or services are delivered and scale up. And they also want to see a strong process of identifying and mitigate, uh, mitigating risk. Uh, here we're talking about market risk, credit risk, currency risk. And finally is a financial access, uh, access strategy. And uh, we have not really seen many successful exits, uh, in, particularly in small and medium sized clean energy companies. And uh, this uh, type of requirement is particularly important for, uh, uh, for some companies that are looking for to expand uh, or to their business or expand their business into market or scale up. And Thank you, um, Nancy. I think we are just close to uh, our kind of time. Uh, uh, I just want to come back to all the panelists. Uh, I know it's a big question, but if you have any thoughts on the reducing, how do we reduce the currency hedging risk that might be useful for the participants and then we can quickly close the session. So any of the panelists uh, would like to come forward and speak. Anurag, I would be a, probably a beneficiary of this, but my hope is that uh, folks like USA and all the DFIs, wherever you have a grant capital, probably even if you want to work with the so sovereign governments, give them a pot and say that, you know, you allocate this capital to meet hedging costs, at least partially for company for funds or uh, companies that meet some climate goods. And, and if that happens, then costs will go down. Thanks, Abhishek. And, yeah, and I'm going to refer just... you again to, sorry, Carol, go ahead. I'm just going to say TCX, TCX, hedging for green. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to add to that. So in, in GCF, we don't just uh, provide uh, financing, we can also do guarantees. And they can be used in very flexible manners. And we can share, we, we look to share the risk. And this is uh, the pricing of that will, uh, we're quite flexible on the pricing and it will accommodate the project context. So uh, GCF's funds can be used both for guarantees, but also for, uh, for grants in various ways to reduce the risk to bring in investors. And we will be looking to, and I, I need to add something in this. Um, GCF does not have a credit rating. That means that we can take risks that nobody else can take. And that's the point of us. Uh, so it's not only, net, no, we can't lend our AAA like the World Bank can. We can't lend our AAA to that. But on the other hand, we don't have that credit rating, meaning we can position ourselves. We've done so in geothermal on drilling, for instance, uh, helping uh, companies to, to, uh, to share the risk on, uh, on corporate bonds. Uh, that would be one way, uh, but we've also done that. Uh, you can also on the currency issue do swaps. For instance, in certain countries, maybe not so relevant for Asia anymore, but in African countries, this is still the case. In the Pacific, it, it is the case in some, in some countries where you can do swaps with the pension fund. And, and uh, so I think there's many avenues that uh, GCF can actually support and reduce the risk and also reduce the cost of financing. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. So I think we are already two minutes over, so let's stop here and let me thank all the panelists and I will hand it over back to you, Namrata, for your formal closing. Thanks a lot, Anurag.
Uh, this has been an extremely engaging and invigorating panel discussion on clean energy um, financing by practitioners who are really following this. And I'm sure there'll be lots of reach out to Carol. I can already see those through the questions and you know, entities interested to know more about GCF. But um, the discussions have really brought out the role that innovative financing instruments can play right, in achieving the clean energy transition targets of countries in the region at the required speed and scale. So it was really very encouraging. Each instrument or, or platform that was discussed today by our esteemed panelists will play a very unique role in unlocking capital and catalyzing additional sources of finance. Uh, so with this, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our keynote speaker from ADB, um, Dr. Priyantha Vijayatunkar, for firstly enlightening us on the innovative clean energy financing initiatives of the Asian Development Bank. Senior colleagues from the Indo-Pacific uh, Office of USAID India, uh, John smith Stream, who has been patiently you know, there on the call throughout, and Anurag Mishra. I would like to specially propose a vote of thanks to our eminent panelists today for such an engaging discussion. Uh, Sean Kidney from the Climate Bonds um, Initiative, Harsha from India Grid Trust, Carol Litwin from GCF, Nancy Nguyen from PFAN, and Abhishek Gupta from Caspian Debt. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Asian Development Bank team, the ASEF 2022 organizing team, my colleagues from the South Asia Regional Energy Hub and the SAREP team. Last but not the least, uh, I would like to thank all the participants who've joined from different parts of the world today. We do hope that you benefited from the insightful discussions that took place. Um, I just want to mention that the side event related information and relevant material, that is the presentations, video recording, link, etc., will all be shared with the registered participants of today's event. Uh, so don't worry if you were not able to take down notes or follow the presentations. We'll have this shared across with all of you on your email IDs. With that, I'd like to thank everybody once again and look forward to being in touch with all of you. Thank you so much. Well done all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.